Well, good morning, everyone. We are very pleased to be going into the Minnesota House of Representatives today to pass legislation to protect our first responders. It was really important for us to change the workers' compensation law to make it easier for first responders to get workers' compensation if they get COVID-19. It will be very difficult for some of our first responders to be able to establish exactly how they got COVID-19, but we know they're at much higher risk for contracting the disease because of the work that they're doing for us. They're putting themselves on the line out there. They risk their own safety for us day in and day out. And um, this was a really important step for us to take. This is only the first step that we're taking with regard to workers' compensation. We know that there is some chance that this could pose a tremendous cost burden on the system. We're currently working with all the stakeholders to come up with um, a way to deal with that and, and to organize some language around um, how we're gonna pay for it in the future. What we're hoping for is that we can use some of the federal money that was appropriated and we can create a fund that, that backstops the workers' compensation system. It's really important that the workers' compensation system be sound and stable for all of the workers that rely on it. But right now in this pandemic, it's also very important that we step up and we say to our nurses and our doctors and our firefighters, uh, our EMTs, that we are there for you and we will be with you if you contract COVID-19 while you're taking care of other people. Good morning. Now more than ever, Minnesotans are looking out for each other. Neighbors are looking out for neighbors. Teachers are looking out for students like they never have before. Hospital, healthcare, home care workers, EMTs, firefighters, police officers are looking out for all of us. In Minnesota, we are very fortunate to have a strong civic spirit, a strong sense of mission, and a desire to help and serve our neighbors. The people who are doing that the most People on the front lines in this pandemic need to have the support of all of us. That's what this workers' compensation bill is all about. It's making sure that the health risks that these first responders and nurses, healthcare providers, uh, and others are, are taking on are not also severe financial risks for themselves and their families. We need to make sure that as they go into harm's way, as they step in to help people without knowing who might have COVID-19 or any other health condition, that we are there to support them if their families are unable to provide uh, for their, themselves because of their income loss due to this disease. We are changing the presumption in law so that people who are first responders and healthcare workers can uh, establish that they are entitled to workers' compensation benefits if they show that they have COVID-19. It would be almost impossible for them to prove mm -hmm. where they got it because they are exposed in so many places uh, because they are not able to stay at home. So we are working to make sure that those first responders and healthcare workers have the benefit of workers' compensation without having to prove in a court of law or through the workers' compensation system where exactly they got it. Uh, we do know that this will pose additional costs for employers and for uh, the workers' compensation system in general, and we are committed to finding a way to equitably, equitably and, and uh, responsibly uh, provide that cost uh, or, or to uh, make that cost be distributed out amongst uh, a larger group of employers against uh, for the state taxpayer to make sure that local government units in the state of Minnesota aren't bearing the whole burden either. We need to make this spread out across the whole system so that all of Minnesota is participating in the support of our first responders and healthcare workers. We okay. are ready for your questions. Uh, first question is from Kevin Featherly. It says, this is off topic, but I'm wondering if you expect that the public safety bill heard yesterday in an info only session, and then judiciary bill to be heard tomorrow uh, will show up on the House floor to be debated and argued on April 14th. Way too early to say right now um, what we're looking at for legislation that we would take up on April 14th. It has to be signed off by all four caucuses and the governor's office. I think the issues that were raised there uh, are, are early in discussions with all of the, uh, the folks who would have to sign off for action on April 14th. Uh, next up is Mary LaHammer, who has a video question. Go ahead. She's muted. Shoot, hello. Oh, there you go. Better at this being on TV. We're still learning. <laughs> Uh, my question is, what is the price tag on this and how do you pay for it? I've heard as much as $500, 600000000 million. 
So, so we are we are dealing with uh, estimates and projections from the Department of Commerce and the Department of Labor and Industry. Uh, and obviously, we don't know the course of this disease, how many people in Minnesota will be infected, or how it will particularly hit our first responders and healthcare workers. The most likely and best projection is around $320 million, but uh, at worst case, uh, it could go up to $580 million, which is why it's so important that we address how to deal with the funding. Uh, we have proposed multiple uh, avenues to approach this, including uh, simply creating a task force to do it, but we could not get agreement from uh, all four legislative caucuses on any of those proposals, and we will continue to work at it to make sure that we are uh, being uh, responsible and distributing the cost out of this uh, proposal to as many, uh, to as much of the state as possible so that no one group is hit too hard by this uh, cost. So how do you pass a bill without knowing how much it's going to cost today? We have to get this protection for first responders right away. If we don't pass this bill today, they will not have protection tomorrow. And so, uh, yes, we are dealing in uncertain times. We don't know what the budget forecast for the state's going to look like. We don't know what needs we're going to have in almost any area that we're working on right now. And so what we're trying to do is triage the most essential issues that have to be funded now in order to deal with this crisis. This is partly about having the backs of firefighters and police officers and nurses and healthcare workers, but it's also making sure that we have people who are confident enough to go in and do the job and stop, the, and stop as much of the crisis as we can right now. We do not want to be in a situation where people feel like they can't uh, risk their uh, financial future by continuing to serve us. We need to deal with this now, and we will, fig we will figure out the cost. The other thing to keep in mind is that we have more than a billion dollars coming from the federal government. My understanding is that Minnesota's proportion of the $2.2 .2 trillion package is um, around $1.87 billion, and, and that that money has to be spent on first order COVID-19 expenses. So, uh, you know, we're all furiously trying to un pack the federal legislation. There's a lot of different categorical aids. Some of the money goes directly to Office of Justice programs or Department of Education for a very specific purposes. But then the other option is that the cost is spread out among all of us. And I think when you look at um, the, the cost that this pandemic will impose on Minnesotans and you look at the nurses and the doctors and the firefighters and the police officers putting themselves on the front line, wh whether we pay for it with federal dollars, whether we pay for it with state tax dollars, or whether we socialize the cost across the entire workers' compensation system, we owe a duty to these folks and we will find a way to pay for it. Okay, next question is from Peter Callahan. How different is the bill from two weeks ago? I would say the bill has a lot more clarity and the majority leader can speak to this. Um, you know, I don't think that there really was a bill two weeks ago. I think um, about a week ago, there were, there were discussions around uh, concepts, but I think what we have right now is very clear that for this class of first responders, we are treating COVID-19 differently than we treat an occupational disease normally. Normally, it's very difficult for an individual to, to recover uh, when they make a claim for workers' compensation on an occupational disease. They have to establish that they got that occupational disease arising out of and in the course of their employment. That is going to prove to be very difficult in, in the COVID-19 situation where we have firefighters and nurses treating a lot of people coming in, into contact with a lot of people in the public. So for this class of people, they'll be treated differently. Now it's important to know though, we didn't change the workers' compensation system in total. So another individual, let's say a reporter who contracts COVID-19 on the job would still be able to make a claim for workers' compensation as an occupational disease. They just would have to establish that they can contracted this occupational disease arising out of and in the course of their employment, which is the current workers' comp standard. This bill started uh, in a conversation with the Minnesota professional firefighters, and they were concerned because they had seen examples in Washington State and other places of large numbers of firefighters uh, getting sick and trying to draw on workers' comp, and they didn't feel confident that the current system 
would serve them. The biggest change uh, that we have created beyond this presumption is to include far more first line workers or frontline workers than we started with. We heard about it first from the firefighters and then we heard about it from nurses, we heard about it from other healthcare providers, we heard about it from home healthcare providers. So the uh, men and women who are going in to take care of people who are uh, disabled or who need in-home services and they have to go in and take care of those people regardless of whether somebody in that house is uh, sick with COVID-19. So we expanded the circle to include many more frontline healthcare providers and first responders than we originally started with. And we provide that same pre presumption to all of them. Okay, next question is uh, Ricardo Lopez. What is the cost estimate of the bill, which I think has been addressed? The second part was, are there any projections as to how many workers comp claims will be filed related to COVID-19? The Department of Commerce and Department of Labor and Industry have uh, put together projections on the numbers covered. I don't have those numbers in front of me, but that is how they developed this model of uh, $320 million. Uh, but as I said, it, it's a model. The only thing we know for sure about it is that it's wrong. And the course of this disease and its effect on first responders and healthcare workers is unknown in Minnesota at this point in time. All right, next question from John Croman. Uh, for this bill, did you decide the proof required would be a lab test result or would a doctor's letter work in cases where the first responder couldn't get a lab test in time? Yeah, we negotiated that pretty carefully. Uh, if, if a test is unavailable to the employee, then a doctor or a, a nurse practitioner or other healthcare provider who is providing the diagnosis uh, can provide a written uh, statement and that will suffice for purposes of proof. All right, next question is from Steve Karnowski. Tell us about the bigger picture of all the hearings the House is holding this week. Will any of the legislation get enacted? What bills might come up in the next floor session later this month? For our committee action, uh, we have prioritized the, the bills that are most likely to be passed this session. So um, with the reviser working out of their home, the House research working out of their homes, the capacity of the Minnesota House of Representatives to process bills is not the same as, if, as it would be if we were in the state capitol. So we've tried to focus the work on the things that are most likely to find bipartisan agreement and to get done. Uh, there's been, there are six uh, hearings scheduled this week, and I think they're all pretty high priority issues. Okay, two part question next from Dana Ferguson. Do you know how many first responders have sought uh, workers comp for COVID-19 so far? And can you address some of your other top priorities in terms of COVID-19 response and how conversations around those proposals are working out with the Senate? I'll take the first part of the question. Uh, we do have uh, an indication that the numbers are quite low so far. I don't think we have a full data set yet to understand what the total uh, number of claims are at the, at the moment, but from what we have uh, been able to learn from uh, the workers' comp insurance system uh, in that industry, we don't have a lot of claims yet. And that's very, very good because as I said, this bill is effective tomorrow. And so unfortunately, workers who uh, would file a claim yesterday wouldn't have the same presumption in law. So we're, we're making sure to get this done as quickly as possible. And, and it seems like we are doing it before a significant number of first responders are making claims. I would say the next highest priority would be housing assistance payments. And I'm hopeful that we're getting somewhere on that. Uh, when we look at the April 14th session, there are a lot of things that could happen. I think that we're uh, extremely close, if not there, on insulin. Um, we have been having discussions about uh, local governments and how to let them comply with the open meeting law and use technology that people have to use during this pandemic. Um, one of the pieces that's interesting that we might have some agreement on is allowing people to get marriage licenses. Um, giving counties the option to off offer that online. Right now you have to go in person. So we have people who would like to get married in the state of Minnesota who currently can't because of the in-person application requirements. So there's a lot of different things that could be ready by the 14th. It really depends on um, bipartisan agreement. All right, next one from Jesse Van Berkel. Uh, the majority leader mentioned spreading this cost out across the whole system. What might that look like? So we, along with the administration, have proposed uh, two ways to do that as a starting point. 
Uh, one is to aggregate claims and get faster access to a workers' comp reinsurance system that we have uh, created. And the other is to allow employers to provide paid leave for the first two weeks of a workers' comp claim and in the alternative to a workers' comp claim in case they would rather fund uh, that leave in a different way. Uh, so those have been two suggestions brought forward by the Walls administration, uh, which we have supported. Uh, unfortunately, we've not had agreement on those two issues. We are also looking at the possibility of using federal funds, as the speaker mentioned, to uh, backfill the uh, some sort of special fund to provide for the first two weeks at the state level. Uh, and we are considering uh, other sources of funds to provide essentially a form of reinsurance or a first line benefit before the workers' comp system gets started. But we really are in, with those new ideas, they came forward yesterday uh, from uh, the other caucuses and we have not had an opportunity to find agreement on those yet. Um, but the, the point is, at some point, whether it is through state tax dollars, federal tax dollars, uh, through uh, higher premiums in the workers' comp system, or an assessment for the workers' comp uh, reinsurance program in some way or another, spreading the costs away from just these uh, single uh, employers is going to be part of a solution. All right, next question from Bill Werner. The legislature is appropriating a lot of money without knowing what the state's budget situation is. Most believe it will be a large deficit. What can you tell Minnesotans about what budget cuts might be necessary? How soon will you start dealing with that and are tax increases possible? So uh, Commissioner Myron Franz will be appearing in front of the Ways and Means Committee to give testimony on that issue. I think it is Monday the 13th, I wanna say around 2.15 or 2.45 maybe is the hearing start time. Uh, I believe that Commissioner Franz testified in front of the Senate work group yesterday. We are currently waiting for some updated economic numbers that should come in on April 10th that would give us a better idea. Uh, we do know that we had a, a carryover of about $800 million um, from the prior uh, fiscal year, uh, which is helping. The cash flow account was, was healthy, and we know that our budget reserves are healthy. Um, with the federal money, uh, we think that because of Minnesota's um, prudence over the last several years that we're we're in decent shape. Obviously, um, the economic downturn, though, will hit state collections and how long we're going to be in good shape is unclear and how long our collections will be hit is really unclear. So there is a lot of uncertainty, but we're right now in a battle to, to solve this public health emergency. And I'm really confident that Minnesotans are going to be able to bounce back economically over a period of time. But right now, our focus is on providing for the very urgent needs that people have. Um, so I, I will have much more specifics on the, the financial future for the state in, over probably the next 10 days to two weeks. And then um, it's my understanding that Commissioner Franz will be doing doing an entirely new budget forecast in either May or June. We just don't have enough information yet to do a new budget forecast. All right, next question. How different is the final draft of the bill from what was sent out to media on Sunday night? That is the bill that we will be voting on. It's five pages, so um, everybody can read the entire thing in a pretty short period of time. And I think the relevant paragraph is like on page three. And so it's it's one paragraph. It's really kind of the, the meat of the bill. All right, just a couple more questions, I think. Um, another one from Kevin Featherly. There was a similar bill a few years ago related to PTSD claims. Did that bill provide the template for this one? It provided the model for how we proceeded uh, to create a presumption in law. I think that this bill is much better for workers than the PTSD bill is because it's much harder to establish PTSD than it is to establish COVID-19. So under the COVID-19 presumption, all you need to have is a doctor's note or a test showing that you have the disease and you uh, have established your burden of proof to get workers comp if you fall into one of the employment categories. So I would expect that the uh, claims will be easier for workers than they even have been under the PTSD bill that we passed. All right, next one from Peter Callahan. Are the Minnesota COVID Fund Commission meetings being conducted in a transparent way? The statute suggests they are, but I haven't seen posted meetings or ability to observe. 
So the way that legislative response commission works is the same way as the legislative advisory commission, which is that there's generally speaking no hearings. There's a request by the commissioner of management and bu budget uh, sent by email to the members on the commission. Um, and then we can uh, turn around and approve or give a negative recommendation. And there would have to be three people in the house and the Senate who would disapprove before we would get to a point where we would have anything to have a conversation about. So if, if all of the House members or all of the Senate members on the Legislative Response Commission approve, MMB can go ahead and make the expenditure. So far, the kinds of expenditures that we have approved have all been uh, directly medical equipment or PPE. Uh, Peter, with a quick follow-up, can't those MMB requests be posted? I think that they can, and I don't see any reason why they wouldn't be. Um, we can follow up with uh, the Commissioner of Management and Budget and, and get back to you on that. Uh, last question, I think, from John Croman. Any thoughts on the letter from law enforcement groups to the MDH Commissioner asking for addresses of those who tested positive? Well, this is a real important balance for us to, to achieve. We need to protect our um, our uh, first responders from uh, any unnecessary risks, but we, people also have a right to privacy. So um, I think that's a conversation we're definitely going to have to have, um, but it, it seems to me, it just strikes me, and I shouldn't probably even comment before diving into the issue a little bit deeper, that uh, we have to have the personal protective equipment that folks need. They need to have a very clear understanding of why they're going to an address before they get to the address. But as for releasing specific information about people who've been diagnosed, um, that I think would be a high burden for us to, to get to the point where we are sharing that kind of information. I don't know if the majority leader has a more wise and circumspect answer on that. Well, I just think this raises the issue that came up as we were working on this bill, which is that employees would like to be notified by their employers if they have been exposed to COVID-19. That notification, uh, of, for employees is something that we originally had in this bill and pushed hard on, but could not get agreement from the business community uh, side of things that we should be uh, notifying these employees who are part of this group uh, that the bill applies to that they have been exposed in the workplace. That doesn't directly address the uh, peace officers' request, but it does raise an important issue that people who are on the front lines. Uh, where we can provide them some information that is safe and uh, consistent with privacy standards, uh, we should be trying to do that as much as we can. All right, one last question. Uh, this one's from Theo Keith, and then we'll wrap up. Uh, broader question, are you hearing the same criticisms about the economic impact of the stay-at-home order as Senate Republicans say they are from constituents? Do you think Minnesotans need to hear that there's a light at the end of the tunnel? You know, I am not receiving people um, complaining to me saying that they think that the governor's stay at home order was ill advised or they think that the economic losses that they're experiencing aren't justified by the public health emergency. I am not getting that from people weighing into my office. I will say as a policymaker for the state of Minnesota, I am, of course, gravely concerned about the economic impact. And I do think that we all of us really psychologically, we need a light at the end of the tunnel. Um, to know, kind of have some idea in our mind, how many weeks are we going to persist in this state of suspended animation? And so what I'll say is I think the, the governor is doing a good job of putting the information out there for the public that he's basing his decision on. I think we're going to get a lot more clarity this week from him about the factors that he's looking at to make decisions about whether to extend the stay at home order and which businesses that he's going to allow to reopen if some are allowed to reopen and others are not. He is, um, you know, I, I love um, listening to his 2 p.m. briefings because he's a person like I am. He processes by talking about it. And he is explaining to us at those 2 p.m. briefings that he is weighing that every day, the public health information he's getting and wanting to make decisions um, that are in the best interest of the economy insofar as he can, consistent with taking care of the public health. We know, of course, that the decisions made to save human lives in Minnesota are having significant financial and economic consequences for thousands and thousands of people. It is not anything that the governor or any of us take lightly at all. 
we do feel like the governor has struck the right balance so far in trying to maintain the basic systems of support that we all need in our lives and not taking steps that are too drastic just for the sake of it, but doing it solely to try to preserve human life and get us to the point where we can respond as quickly and as uh, adequately as Minnesota possibly can to this attack on the lives of us. And the, the fact is that we would see devastating loss of human life if we were not taking these actions. We also know that it is not equitable. The losses suffered by Minnesotans because of the decisions that we've had to make do not fall equally amongst all of us. People who have resources, people who have savings, people who have incomes and jobs that can be done remotely are not everyone. In fact, a lot of the people who are uh, the most vulnerable in our society have the least income, uh, who have uh, the least uh, housing, food, and other kinds of security are going to be affected the most. Uh, so we, none of us take this lightly. And certainly uh, the small businesses, restaurants, and others that are suffering from this uh, are in very serious condition. And we know that we will have to have a very robust state response to match the federal response in order for Minnesotans to come out of this as whole as we can possibly make them. But we do not in any way uh, think that this is a small impact. It's huge. And the only reason we're doing it is to save thousands of lives. And two pieces of good news that Minnesotans can hang on to. The actions that we've taken so far are making a difference. We are saving lives. No doubt about it. The data, the data is suggesting that. And the second thing is that there are these heroes out there who are willing to, to go to work every day, knowing the risks that they face, um, to be there to take care of us if we need it. So um, it's really an honor today to be going into the House to vote to serve them. So thanks for joining us this morning, and we'll see you at the Capitol in some form or another.